Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Ann Boyles with the Washington Student Achievement Council. With me this morning is um, Stephanie Casino, who is the State Board PeopleSoft um, representative, uh, Carla Idle Corwin, our Senior uh, Associate Director, Marla Skelly, the Associate Director for uh, Compliance and Training. I am going to turn this presentation over to Carla. Good morning, everybody. If you can't hear, please make sure you let us know in the chat box. Um, this morning, you have about 100 years of financial aid experience <laughs> professionals sitting at the table, which is a bit overwhelming when I did the math earlier. Uh, but we each have different perspectives and experiences, and so we draw from campus experience, uh, consultant experience, hands-on user experience, and program administration experience. And so um, that's kind of the, the bag of tricks for the people sitting at the table. This is our 49th year of the unit record and the state need grant program. So next year we'll celebrate uh, the big 5-0 for the program. The purpose of the unit record really is to provide us with data that we can use to inform the legislature, uh, to develop policy decisions and recommendations, and be able to help shape the future of financial aid for students in the state of Washington. It does do institutional comparisons, so it lets us uh, look at all the different sectors. It assesses the needs of our students and uh, unmet need as well. And Becky, uh, Thompson and Rochelle Sharp use this heavily when meeting with legislators and OFM and looking at different models and funding requests. So the, the quality of the data is very important for those reasons. We also have a really sophisticated model that we use to try different levers and test to see if, if we change A over here, what does it do to B over there, what does it require in terms of additional funding, and so uh, the data that you give us is absolutely critical, and that's why we um, work so heavily with institutions to try to make sure we're getting clean data. It also gives us a central data repository for being able to answer the questions that we may get. And although the legislative session doesn't start until January, we've already been meeting with legislative type staff, uh, either legislative staffers and or OFM to provide some of the data that we currently have. The timeline for your unit record is listed on the screen before you. The manual is available on our website. The application is open. And we do have two schools who have been in there uh, working on their data as we speak. I know some of the CTCs have to wait for some of the timelines that we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but know that it is open and available. We need your finalized report by October 19th. We did intentionally schedule that a week after WAFA so that there are no uh, scheduling conflicts. We do ask that you start as early as possible based on availability of your system and documentation provided by the State Board. And once you submit your application or your unit record data to us, we spend a couple of months actually doing the analysis on the data, making sure the edits make sense and that we're able to approve and release the data. We do actually edit and finalize before it is released publicly, and usually um, in December is when we start providing reports to policymakers as they're shaping their agendas for the legislative session. You also can look at your profiles in the unit record uh, we make the current year, so the 17-18 information will be published in January of 2019. You can look at historical reports as well, and Anne's going to show you a little bit uh, later how to access some of the other reports available to you on demand. In our manual, there's, some, there's five, technically, five different sections. The introduction really just gives you the what's new, what's different. So for those of you that go after the Cliff Note version, that's the here's what's changed, here's what uh, you need to know, here's what you need to prepare for. 
but of course we love it if you read the whole manual. So you get brownie points if you do. Uh, general Chapter one is just the general instructions, how to. Uh, two is your data definitions. Three is how to use the portal and, and the application itself. And probably the most important and most frequently used section is the, are the appendices. Typically, um, C, D, and E are going to be your go-to sections because you're trying to figure out why does it not work or where do I stick this financial aid program. Um, and you have a couple of different ways that you can look that up. You will be submitting your report by CSV file. And you're only going to be reporting students who receive financial aid based on the 2017-18 FAFSA or WASPA. You will have to make sure you have a header row included in your CSV file and that you look at those field definitions to make sure you've got the right programs in the right bucket. We do have a sample CSV format on our website. Our layout has not changed. And for CTC Link Schools, you'll notice the biggest change on uh, the state reporting is your file path, and that's new since our AWS migration. You'll still enter your institution and aid year. The report type will be left blank, and then select Run. Then from the state reporting process scheduler request, you'll choose Unit Record Report and say OK. For your reporting requirements and determining which students to include, as you know, it's your 1718 students who filed a FAFSA or a WASPA. We want all of your need-based aid recipients as well as your non-need-based federal loan recipients. And Appendix A gets into the uh, details of each of those categories if you have questions. We do also um, sometimes get non-need-based federal loans that maybe didn't uh, go all the way through the process, but you don't, those ones you don't have to report, just so you know that, that you may have one bucket that falls off. For our CTC link schools, the unit record report selects need-based recipients and non-need-based federal loan recipients. And as you can see from the slide, which I'm not going to read to you, those are the programs that we need you to report on. Just a couple of highlights. The teacher shortage conditional grant is going to be reported under conditional loans, not to be confused with the student teaching grant, which you reported on your 2016-17 unit record under other state funded gift assistance. So that is a different bucket, different program. We also highlighted on that slide which ones require the FAFSA or WASPA as well as the ones that require a valid work authorization with DACA. Some of the other programs to report include the ones listed on this screen. We are looking at trying to capture a complete picture of what types of assistance students are receiving in the state of Washington. And so we do ask that you report all of these programs that that are need-based. This is a the basic food employment and training program is one that, that kind of caused a few wrinkles uh, in the past and we are asking you if your need-based recipients are receiving it and that you and and if you can easily retrieve this information from your system that you include those amounts. You do include it in the workforce training funds bucket on your table because it is a subset of that. Programs to report again, your non-need-based federal loans if there's a FAFSA on file. So we are trying to capture not just need and unmet need, but if we can, we like to look at the picture of indebtedness because we do get some questions on that. We recognize there may be gaps that we have to pull other information on, but as much as you can give us is, is good. For our CTC link schools, there are some global setups for the unit record report the ethnicity category, and award category. Award category need-based FAFSA, WASA data required or optional, non-need-based loans or other award maximum amounts, and State Board has updated the global configuration for the Pell and Teach grant valid input. 
for the institution, they have some configuration that they'll need to do on their end. Their award categories are linked to a financial aid item type and award status. So for our first links, you'll want to add your additional Pell Grant item type to your institution's configuration. And if anybody awarded and dispersed a teacher conditional loan in the 17-18 year, you'll want to add that as well. I mentioned earlier uh, the Cliff Notes version of what's new and different. So we do highlight those on page III in the manual at the very beginning for those of you that just want to jump in and see what's different. We do ask that you're uh, reporting or require that we're re you are reporting the full assessed tuition amounts and the cost of attendance for your state aid recipient before tuition waivers are taken into account. And uh, we'll also, we are looking for consistency, so you're going to be reporting your waivers as either need-based or non-need-based institutional gift aid as appropriate, so different award codes depending on uh, what type of, of assistance it is. One of the most significant changes that we have made for the unit record for this year was, in the past we were comparing the unit record to the final interim report. And as you all know, there's a lot of activity that goes on between uh, July 5th or 6th or 7th, whenever it is due, and the end of your summer two term close and the submission of unit records. So we now are going to be comparing to Seesaw data, so it's more real time. And that way, hopefully, it will help all of you in terms of edits and not, not having as many edits that you have to respond to. We also are asking that you pay close attention to your race ethnicity data. Uh, if you leave the fields blank, they get counted as no or false. So we do prefer an entry of Y or N if the field is known. Again, the teacher shortage conditional grant goes under conditional loan, different than the program that was in place 1617. We have expanded the valid input ranges to accommodate the year-round Pell and increase in teach. For your reporting requirements, the Social Security number is the most critical field in terms of making sure we can identify those students. And so please make sure that you're submitting this information according to the record file layout. We are asking for aid for all five terms. We recognize that some colleges do have a summer one and a summer two. Uh, some of our clock hour schools as well as our continuous enrollment schools do that. Please watch that when you're reporting, edit your data and watch out for things like social numbers labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, as those are not valid. The CSV file that you will be submitting does require a header row or it will cause uh, submission issues. Again, we're looking for the five terms and summer one is usually your header or leader term with summer two being the end, end of your academic year. We recognize uh, for our clock hour and rolling enrollment schools that you do have to equate that to those five terms and there is a chart uh, that we provide for you on page 66 of the State Need Grant Manual that's published each year that also gives you those definitions as well as it's included later in this presentation. We're asking that you do report your summer aid if, if it is based on the 1718 FAFSA or WASPA. And if the student, uh, if you have a term where the student has uh, many terms in summer, so you may have many semesters or many, many quarters, you report the total amount as one enrollment term. Additional fields that we ask for you to report are your FAFSA and WASPA related fields, so marital status, dependency, family size, number in college, family income, et cetera. And what's really important is if you, for some reason, had awarded a student but later rescinded the award because of a change on an ICER, it's important that you update the information in the unit record in Seesaw as well to make sure that it explains why that student is no longer eligible. So for example, if you have a student paid on an 01 transaction, they were fully state need grant eligible, an 03 transaction comes through, they're no longer eligible, 
you return the money, which is great, but when you go to submit the unit record, that income information is not going to match what is in Seesaw and it's going to cause an edit for you. A few notes about some of our sensitive fields. Uh, you cannot submit duplicate Social Security numbers, and so it'll be important if you have any issues that arise when you're preparing your, your data that you reach out to our office because it, there are some instances where you have a duplicate social number, the file is uh, not going to upload, number one, for you, but number two, we need to make sure that we have the correct history for each student by social number because that is how their QERs are tracked and monitored and we need to make sure that the history is linked. So please reach out to us if, if you encounter that. Anne is your primary go-to, but Marla and I are her backup and we'll work with our IT team to make sure that those are taken care of. For the year in school, this is another fun little chart. Um, I wanted to make sure that you understand that you report the enrollment level as of the beginning of the last term that they received financial aid. So if you have a student who may be progressing from junior to senior status mid-year and they receive money that final term, they would be reported in that instance as a senior. The other uh, item to keep in, in mind is the status eight. And the status eight is for your running start students or non-high school grads, for example, who may receive need-based aid. I understand there's some institutional options there that you may choose to do or not. Please don't just automatically use the year in school that is on the FAFSA or the WASPA, because as we all know, that's not necessarily accurate. For the CTC Link schools, the year in school value is reported as beginning of the term for the student's last financial aid disbursement for the year. It's a combination of earned units between the ranges indicated in the URR manual, whether or not students are matriculated into a BAA, BAS program, and an SLDS loan year on FA term. Additional edits that we review in sensitive fields have to do with your family size and the number in college. We are asking that you report what you, uh, the, based on the data that was on the FAFSA or the WASFA that you actually awarded on. And we're looking for basic things like if it's a dependent student, there has to be at least two people in the household and at least one in the household if they're an independent student. Number in college, we're doing some edits there as well to make sure that it doesn't exceed the family size and a reminder that you don't include parents in college unless it was done as a professional judgment. For the family income fields, you're not going to be using dollar signs or cents, and this is the one field where you can report a negative income. For our CTC Link schools, family income amount pulls from the state need grant eligible data page. If the student is dependent, only the parent taxable and non-taxable income are included. If the student is independent, both the student and spouse's taxable and non-taxable taxable income are included. Negative family income values will be included if applicable. When you're reporting the expected family contribution, please make sure that you're reporting the federal methodology calculations. Some of you do still use institutional methodology for other reasons and we do not want institutional methodology values. If for some reason you have processed a professional judgment decision, make sure that you are reporting the one you actually awarded on, and obviously that would be, would be updated. Please make sure that the EFC that you report matches the number of months in the need duration. For your cost of attendance, we recognize that there are probably um, 999 different budgets out there to reflect your students' particular expenses, either by program or living arrangement. Make sure that you're reporting the student budget amount that is linked to the need, as well as the EFC. Again, those, the EFC, COA, and need duration all need to be based on the same number of months. For the need amount, our friendly formula there is uh, one that is all too familiar. In, when you're reporting the need amount, you cannot report a negative amount, so you would just put a zero in that place. Again, integers between 1 and 12. Know that if for some reason you award a student based on a nine-month award and the student leaves after one term, you are not required to go back and recalculate everything to a three-month duration. 
If it's your policy, your institutional policy to do that, you certainly can. Just make sure that you adjust all three fields, need, COA, and EFC to that same three month period if that's your business practice. Your different definitions for uh, enrollment levels are listed here, and we're consistent pretty much with uh, the rest of the universe. People always ask why why is there why does it go one two three five, and um, that just seems to be a longstanding definition that's existed federally even uh, for forever. So I can't answer the history. If anybody can can shed light on that, please do. For our career schools, you're going to be reporting, or for clock hours, anybody that has clock hours, you're going to be reporting 300 hour increments with the exception of perhaps the last term that could be part time. For the CTC link schools, the enrollment statuses are pulled from the FA load field on FA term. These FA term values are translated and included in the CSV data file, for example, full time F three-quarter time T, et cetera. Earlier I referred to page 66 of the State Need Grant Manual, and this chart also matches that. So if you have rolling start enrollments or are a clock hour school, these are the term equivalencies that you would use when reporting your awarding information as well as your enrollment information. For, excuse me, each of these programs, you're going to be reporting your final awards received by the students. And so, for example, if you awarded a student initially but then realized there was an awarding error and they should have only received a half-time payment, you need to make sure that you not only, A, return the money, but also adjust the enrollment level for that student or it's going to create some edits. And we'll go over later how to respond to the different edits. And again, this is mandatory for 2017-18, the reporting of tuition waiver dollars for college-bound and state new grant recipients. And so uh, that is outlined in the 2018-19 state new grant manual. It was also covered in the 2017-18 state new grant manual and is also listed in the unit record manual. It's really important that you're reporting those as either need-based or non-need-based depending on the, type, the nature of the award. For state work study, we're asking that you report two different categories, on campus and off campus. We are looking for the gross earnings. You do not include sick leave. And we do look for the summer employment as well. There are two different methods you can use for reporting. You can do actual gross earnings, or you also have the option of doing an average over the academic year. We do validate those final figures at the end of the unit record reporting cycle with state work study program staff, and if we have questions, we, they will reach out to you. For your institutional gift aid, we're asking that you report in two buckets. It's either need-based institutional gift aid or non-need-based. And so one kind of ties to the need-based being FAFSA, WASFA-based, and the non-need-based could be awarded without regard to having filed one of those forms. We're asking that you report other state-funded gift assistance, and there are some examples listed on the screen here as well. So we're capturing the complete picture. Many of you have experienced processing edits, and, and the edits are helping us to do checks and balances to make sure we have quality data at the end of the process. Be aware, I guess, that we do monitor trends in the different edits, and if we see something occurring too frequently, we do go back and look at what can we do on our side to help address some of those issues, make corrections if we need to in some of the logic, and so we do listen to you, we do take your feedback, but we're also watching uh, behind the scenes as well to try to continuously improve. Some of the edits that prevent your file from uploading are listed on the screen here. And I've mentioned them earlier, so your header row missing, uh, duplicate social numbers, just random invalid codes. And so if you look at page 45 in the manual in Appendix C, it gives you the 12 blockers, basically, that will stop the upload process. There are also some non-overridable edit examples. That means you have to fix it before you can, can go forward. So uh, a good example is non-resident with, with state need grant or other aid. You also may be able to, to process through some of the 
upload, and then you run secondary edits, and it stops you there. So um, just so you know, there are two levels of edits that, that occur. Appendix C also has additional information on some overridable edits. So pages 46 through 48 give you some examples of what can happen. And these ones, we just need you to give us a succinct, clear explanation. So for example, student, uh, student's date of birth is outside the normal range. And I was just looking at one of these yesterday, and the student really is 77 years old, and that is outside the normal range. So uh, just so you know that some, there are edits that you will just need to give us a brief, concise explanation. For the CTC Link School, there are three edit reports that are generated when you run your unit record report. We recommend that the reports be reviewed in work in order that they're shown here to verify that setup and errors are addressed prior to reviewing data to be included in the UR extract file. The first report is report C, and that's the missing item type report. This report will identify any FA item type that has been awarded to a student with an amount greater than zero and qualifies to be reported in the URR file, but the item type does not exist in the URR configuration setup. The next report is report B, and this is the error and detail error detail and summary report. It's broken down into two separate sections. The first tab contains a list of students sorted by last name, first name, and Apple ID who have one or more errors. The error message number and description are included. The second tab contains a list of all error messages encountered, encountered on the first tab with a total student count for each. You can view Appendix C in the URR doc for suggestions on resolving each error condition. And Report A is the student detailed report. This report provides a list of student details to be included in the extract file. In addition, the dollar amounts for each award received by the student is tallied and provided in the total column. A few reminders as you're addressing the overrides is to please be concise, but give us enough information that we can actually uh, follow the, the logic behind the decision that was made. When you're reporting the total family income, keep in mind that state need grant income is not the same as total income as reported on the FAFSA. So making sure that you're um, relying on the fields that Stephanie referred to earlier will be critical. The one piece of information that I don't know if all aid administrators are aware of is if you have a student who has received child support as part of their income, and they enroll less than half time, you are required to remove that child support income from the calculation. Make sure that you are matching the EFC, COA, and need duration. That is a big edit error. And one, one thing I forgot to mention on the prior slide is when you're responding to override comments related to some of the household size and income information, please make sure that you include the FAFSA transa transaction number that you paid on so that we can then start matching it up when we're, at, we're reviewing the edit comments. Uh, sometimes, you, as you know, students may have 10, 20, or 90 different FAFSA transactions, and for us, it's easier to be able to zero in on the same one that you utilized. We do ask also, when you're reporting all known uh, race categories that that you actually mark, even when it's marked yes for Hispanic, that you provide the additional information, and that you, um, if you, you know, don't have that information, we do understand, but, but in most instances, schools are collecting it. Reminders for the CTC Link system. You'll want to reconcile your awards, add or update your configuration tables, run your URR, this can be run as many times as needed, and the CS CSV data file is generated each time you run the report, so you can review it. You'll want to review the report and correct your errors. You can rerun the unit record report, download the CSV data file to your desktop or local network drive, and upload the CSV to the WASAC portal. A few tips and best practices as you're working on your unit record is please start early, don't wait for the deadline. 
That allows you to receive technical assistance in a timely manner from us as well. If you have questions, please make sure that you're looking at the unit record manual. And some of you may or may not be aware that there is a, a training site that you can use to test drive your files before you upload them into the live site. And the web address is listed there. The main caution is to let you know that that data is refreshed or the, that site is refreshed every night. So if you work through half of your edits in there but didn't finish the other half, if you upload that same file again tomorrow, it's going to have wiped out everything that you addressed. That is just the test site. Make sure that you're looking at your different uh, informational reports. You can do some data comparisons between your system and what you have uploaded in the unit record system by looking at some of your totals. Uh, make sure that you're, as soon as the uh, State Board has made your information available, that you're taking a look at their manual. And we will be posting this webinar online for those of you who need to share it with others in your office. And we'll send out an email letting you know when that has been posted. We'll open it up now for questions, if anyone has any. Hearing and seeing none, we'll go ahead and continue on to actually using the portal web application. Thank you, Carla. Um, most of you are familiar with our um, portal landing page. There are a couple of ways to get there. Um, the direct address I've shown here at the top of the slide, uh, the fortress.wa.gov WASAC portal. Um, or you can go to our uh, WASAC agency uh, main website, and from that uh, main menu, uh, look under administration. There should be a link that takes you directly to this portal landing page um, from that area as well. Um, once you are here, you can log into the um, unit record portal in a couple of different ways. If you want to go directly to the unit record report, uh, there is a direct link from this financial aid administrators column down in the bottom. Just click on that and it will take you to our unit record welcome page. If you are uh, planning to do other work in the um, the portal first, you can go through our main login, which is here in the upper right-hand corner. If you go in through that main uh, login, you can find the unit record under the program uh, option. Uh, just click on the name in that drop-down list, and it will take you to this landing page. Uh, this welcome page is what you will see the first time you log into the portal before you've done any l uploads of uh, unit record data. And uh, once you have uploaded an initial file, uh, if you exit the portal and come back in to pick up um, working on your report, it will take you directly to the, um, the site that you're actually working in, uh, the ready to begin in progress or submitted, uh, depending on how far you've gotten into uh, working on your report. Um, so that will bypass this page. Uh, once you're ready to begin your upload, just click that button. And what you will see is uh, this notice. Um, click the Browse button. Uh, identify the CSV file in your, your PC. And uh, click Upload. Uh, once you've clicked that, if you have a large file, you will see a processing bar. It gives you a sense of where that's at in terms of uploading records. Um, if you have a very small file, if, uh, then it will probably zip by so quickly that you don't see this at all. If there are um, major issues with uh, your file, uh, you will find that the portal will provide you with uh, an edit um, error message. And uh, it's helpful in that it will tell you where to find those errors. Uh, it provides the row number, the name of the error. And uh, this means that your file did not upload, um, but you do need to click this discard file button in order to eliminate the remnants of what's in there. Uh, make your corrections to your file, and then uh, save those, and then attempt a, a re-upload. 
if you're working in a large file um, and uploading um, and suddenly realize that you've either selected the wrong file or that there are issues with the file that you have started to upload, you can discard that, um, that file immediately without waiting for um, the completion of that upload uh, in this little button. It should probably be about midway on the page to the left-hand side. This is very helpful if, if you have um, a, an extremely large file and, and you don't want to wait until you know, that has processed. Once the, the unit record has um, accepted your uh, file, you will find a brief summary with the number of records uh, broken out by enrollment status. If you are a school, say a CTC, that only has uh, freshmen and sophomore, uh, you won't see any of these other options. Um, it will only show you um, the enrollment statuses for which you have submitted records. Please take a look at that and just you know, make sure that it looks like it's in the realm of, um, of reality before you move forward. Um, once you've clicked to um, process your edits, um, you will start to see any edits shown in the bottom half of the page. Um, it will take a little bit of time for the, the portal to process those edits. Uh, you may periodically click this refresh button in order to load additional um, edits. You may begin working on those edits, but what you may find is that as it adds edits to that, some of the, the processed edits and the non-processed edits will intersperse, so you will have to look through that entire list. Once um, all of the edits have been processed, this refresh button will disappear. Once that uh, refresh button has disappeared, uh, you will be able to review your entire list of edits. And you can filter that by um, various different ways. Uh, for the most part, you'll find uh, that these are the options, but this drop-down list uh, can be used to sort those. One caveat is that um, as you're working through your edits, um, if you have any non-overridable edits, you will not be able to move forward in your processing um, until all of those are addressed. And uh, the non-overridable edits will show up as um, a little uh, icon that looks like uh, a red stop sign. So you'll be able to identify them um, as separate from the overridable edits. And um, there is a column over to the side that, which tells you whether they are overridable or non-overridable. In order to address any of those edits, you would click on the student's social number. And that will open up the student's record. All of the uh, edits will be shown in this upper left-hand column. You'll see that they're all in red. If you plan to... Um, Override, there is an override button here. If you want to make a direct correction, um, there are two tabs, the student demographics and need, depending on whether uh, it's in this tab or in the student aid tab. So you select whichever tab you need to work in, and uh, you can make the corrections directly there. If you choose to um, make the corrections directly, just click in the field that you need to correct and make the change. If it is in um, an award amount, you click directly into that field and make sure whatever actions you take that you always click save at the end. The uh, portal will not save whatever you don't click save for. Now if you are going to make an override um, comment rather than a correction. Once you've clicked that override button, you will see a little pop-up box. Uh, you enter your comment here in this empty box and then click Save. Um, you will see that that edit will then gray out as opposed to one that has not yet been addressed. And if you want to double check what you've entered into that comment box, if you hover your cursor over the blue 
um, eye icon, uh, a little yellow pop-up box will uh, come up and uh, you can see your edit comment there. The next step is uh, to um, take a look at your differences report. Uh, you can get to them uh, by either clicking to continue uh, if you've addressed all of these here, or if you're in the process of working in this, you can take a preliminary look at what there is by clicking this other button down here at the bottom. In the differences report, you will see there are four tabs. Three of them have to do with the main uh, state-funded programs of uh, financial aid. And um, one of the columns will show uh, a why, if it's an override that you have already addressed through that main edit screen. If it's um, an edit that has not yet been uh, addressed, you will notice that there is a blank opposite the name of that edit. So uh, the, first, the first thing you need to do is go through each of these tabs and identify and address each of the edits that are shown there. To do that, if, if there is not a direct link through the social security number, you would be able to click on um, either the unit record or if there's an amount here, sometimes you're able to click on that as well and take a look at what the underlying record shows. If you need to uh, correct or add data to an existing unit record, um, apart from working directly in those discrepancy report tabs, you can find that record by going to the top of the page, clicking unit record, and then click search. And that will then open up that same record um, for that student that you saw earlier in this presentation. If, on the other hand, you find uh, that you have neglected to add a record and it's missing from the unit record, uh, from that main edits page, um, you can click this button. And what it will do is it will open a blank unit record with both of the demographics and need tab and the student aid. Uh, completely fill out both uh, tabs. Um, and remember to save your work. This screen here shows you um, the uh, information that you will be asked to complete on that student aid tab. It will have columns uh, for each of the different uh, terms. And I've shown here uh, on a horizontal basis what you'll see as the list of programs um, that are actually in a vertical order on the actual record. This fourth tab is the missing state need grant unserved students list. And what this list is, is the um, students for whom you have a record in Seesaw showing that that student is unserved, but for whom there is no unit record. So these are students that are missing in the unit record for whom there is a seesaw record. And um, this report will show you uh, what you have reported in seesaw as their enrollment status by term. What we need you to do is initially take a quick look through the list and identify whether or not there are students for whom uh, you know um, may have received some form of, of financial aid. If you identify a student in that um, situation, you will need to go back to that main edit screen and add the student record. Once you have added the student record for that individual, they will disappear off of this missing unserved screen. So we ask you to do that first so you clean out the initial list. Um, once you have completed that, come back and download the rest of the, the unserved list to a CSV file on your PC. At the top of the page uh, is an example of uh, the, a download report. Each of these uh, terms shows um, 
the enrollment status that you've reported in Seesaw for that individual. And in between, I have highlighted um, in red uh, the uh, associated verify column so that um, we ask you not change any of the information in the initial enrollment columns and place any edits or corrections in the verify columns. At the bottom of the page is an example of this um, report that has been completed. If the information that's reported is correct as shown, you don't need to make any edits or changes in the verify columns. All you need to do is indicate yes or why in the column that indicates everything is OK. If, however, there are changes during that term, uh, we ask that you make those corrections in the verify column. Um, then save that to your PC. The reason we ask for this is that your unserved students are taken into account when the um, allotments are um, put into the state need grant model. And we want to be sure that we have accurate information because it could affect the allocation that is provided to your school for the following year. Once you've made those um, edits, to the, the file, uh, we ask that you send it to us uh, by way of the portal secure email system. There is a button on uh, this discrepancies report page. Um, if, if at some point you have exited the portal, because we know that um, if, if there is no activity, actually you know, uh, keyboard clicks in the portal after 10 or 15 minutes, it will boot you out. So we suggest that when you download that report that you perhaps log out of the portal. If you log back in, come back to this page, you can send the secure email as an attachment there. Or you can go to the uh, main menu and uh, find the messages and files option and then um, send us the um, CSV report as a return email attachment there. Um, one of the things that I would like to mention is that uh, we encourage folks uh, as they become aware of changes to an unserved student's uh, enrollment status during the year that they go back into Seesaw at that time and make those changes. One of the things that you may find as you're working in these reports is that um, if you have social security number mismatches, those that are um, incorrect social security numbers in the unit record uh, record can be corrected from the institution side. It's just a matter of updating um, the record and then saving it in the unit record. If, however, the incorrect number is on the seesaw side, uh, that is something that will need to be addressed by uh, WASAC staff. Um, send us uh, a secure email through that same button if, if uh, you have it available to you, um, and give us the details, the student's name, the correct social number, and the incorrect social number. Send it to us, and then we will contact our IT staff to make sure that that gets changed. Um, once that change is affected in the um, Seesaw record, it will clear the discrepancy that shows up here. So um, the first step, as I said, is to identify where that, that issue is, whether it's on the portal side in Seesaw or whether it's in the unit record portal side. Once you have completed each of these four reports, I, you can either go back to that edit list uh, if you need to make more changes or click to continue. Here we're approaching um, submission point. Uh, there is uh, an institutional program totals report below that we ask uh, you to review for, um, for validity. It will show you the last four years of uh, data that you've reported to us, 
as a comparison, uh, as well as the percent change uh, between the last two years in both the dollars and for the number of recipients. Please make sure that um, uh, these look like uh, there aren't any um, obvious errors. Um, if, if you see something that really looks out of place, then you have the opportunity to go back to that edit list or um, back into your search records to make corrections. Uh, if everything appears to be um, you know, valid, then you can click to continue. Before you do that, however, we do ask that you create a PDF of this page for your records. Um, there is a caveat I'd like to uh, mention, and that is that at this point in time, many institutions will have uploaded in their unit record all of their, um, their population, whether they have um, non-need-based aid or need-based aid. Um, after we have closed out the unit record for all institutions, we will go through and we will um, delete all extraneous information. And extraneous information would be non-need-based aid. So um, you may find that some of these uh, percentages uh, don't look quite like what you re recall in your ending report. That is why we ask that you create a PDF of this now because there will be an opportunity for you to create a comparison PDF after that data has been uh, deleted and you'll have a sense of what you uh, can expect to see at this preliminary point and then what your uh, final information looks like after we have deleted that. So, uh, assuming that everything has been reviewed and uh, corrected, uh, at this point you can submit your unit record report. You will see a pop-up that um, asks you um, whether you truly want to submit it because at that point um, you will no longer be able to make any more edits. It will, it will close out your report. Um, this isn't set in stone. If um, you've clicked that and find that, uh, oh no, you've realized there is another change you need to make, as long as we're still in that uh, initial analysis period uh, where we're reviewing the information and checking back with institutions, it's very easy for us to unsubmit your report and for you to go back in and make those additional changes. So please, please, please be sure that you uh, connect in up with us and um, let us know when you're, you're finding uh, or experiencing any issues uh, and then we will work with you as best we can. Once you have clicked that submit report, um, you will see a confirmation here at the top of that page. Also, you will see both the uploaded date and the name of the person who uploaded it and who submitted that report for you. So these are your confirmations, and at that point you can log out. Here, when you um, exit the portal, if you come back in, you have another opportunity, even with a submitted report, to uh, print out another copy of your program totals report. You have information on the demographics distribution as well as uh, the discrepancies that were found in your uh, state need grant college bound and passport reports. These will be available to you until I believe the next year when we reopen the unit record for the, the following year. In other words, this is the 1718 unit record report. These reports will be available to you until we open up the 1819 unit record. At the bottom are institutional profile reports. These are uh, the result of, of the assessments that are done and become available to you in January. Uh, we will notify you when they're uh, available to you, but uh, at this point you, you'll see they're, they're not clickable. So you would find those here in the reports 
button. You can look at your profile reports for previous years by uh, clicking this drop arrow, and it will it will show you. I think it's like three or four years back. Uh, however, once the new unit record uh, opens up, these disappear, and that's the point at which, in January, we ask that you download that program totals report again so that you have a comparison to the preliminary information that you, you have. Stephanie. For our CTC link schools, uh, the UR processing guide is now available on the Reference Center for the 17-18 URR. If you need assistance or have questions with setup or running a unit record report, you can contact ERP support via the service desk. And if you have any questions regarding the Student Achievement Council unit records portal, uh, please make sure you reach out to us because there is a file data handoff once you've uploaded into our system. We do have our manual available online. And then we also have a specific email that we request that you use when asking questions. It's listed there, unit record at wasac.wa.gov. This ensures that there are several of us monitoring it at all times, so if one person's out, it doesn't leave you hanging. The rest of us can respond. We've also provided our direct contact information as well, uh, but again, the unit record email is probably your quickest, quickest way to get quick help in case people are in meetings or out of the office. We will now open it up again for questions. If anyone has any remaining questions either that you want to talk, we've unmuted you, or you can also add it to the chat box. Hearing and seeing none, we're going to go ahead and conclude. We will make this recording available probably next week, and we will send you an email letting you know as soon as it is available. Thanks, everyone, for your participation today, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.